I know. Well, Matt must be recording because he's uh, walking away from the camera, so I would assume he's there. He's done. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, there we go. You know, sometimes you, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have ever been up here before, but sometimes you get nervous. And uh, my dad used to use the old joke of my t tongue gets around my eye tooth and I can't see what I was going to say. And, uh, but you know, I, I think sometimes that Satan makes it so that you feel like you are not worthy to be up here or that uh, what you're going to say is going to put everybody to sleep and you, you know, what's going to happen. And sometimes I think he really doesn't want what you're going to talk about to be spoken of. And I was going to preach on this before, and um, uh, Satan caused the power to go out at the little annex of our church, so I couldn't preach it then. And uh, when Pastor Bob called me today and said that he needed me to do this evening service, this jumped right to the front of my mind. And I've done this sermon before, but sometimes it's like anything else. I think it helps to uh, hear it again and to be encouraged by it. And so the first thing I want you to do is, is I need you to open your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 4. And we're going to be going through quite a few verses. But i got a question for you, and, and I don't know if I'm the only one that ever has this happen to them. So if, it, if you've ever had this happen, I want to know about it. But did you ever feel that Satan is attacking you all the time? I think he has a list of everything that bothers me, and he just goes down the list, and he has to check each and every one of them off every day. And, and, and if I do have a, a difficulty in one area, he sometimes will bring it up over and over and over again, and... Uh, well, I, I think Satan knows all my weak spots. He's been following me for 53 years, and he knows what bothers me. You know, I don't know if you've been married for very long, if you have, but you know what buttons to push to cause your spouse to have difficulties. I mean, you can just, Michelle will say, sometimes I've had all I can take. I'm getting ready to go into the other room because she knows that, that uh, I've, I know now that I have pushed her past her limit. And it's called fair warning around our house. <laughs> yes, it is. And, uh, but anyhow, so Satan seems to know what causes. And the interesting part to me is, is each and every one of us in here, it's different. The things that bother you won't bother me. Things that bother you don't bother me. Things that bother Kathy probably bothers everybody. Okay, but the difficulty comes into it of how do you deal with the situation when he's pushing your buttons? I mean, how do we have complete victory? And I'm not going to say just over one instance. I mean complete victory over everything that Satan does to you. Because he is going to cause you to have conflicts, to have anxiety, to have difficulties and doubts inside of your life that you don't always know how to deal with it, okay? And, and what we're going to do this evening is, is, is we are going to learn how to have victory in every area of our life. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the battles are not going to be fought over and over and over and over again. But what I am going to tell you is, is that we're going to look at the one person that always had victory over Satan, we're going to look at how he dealt with those situations. Now, Jesus was in his physical body when he is dealing with Satan. And he says that the things that, that, that we will do will be greater than the things he did. So that tells me that I can have victory over Satan. Okay? Doesn't mean that, that it's not going to be a battleground, but there's a difference between being in the battle and losing it and being in the battle and having victory. And when you have victory, you understand that the next time that situation comes up, you already got a battle plan. You know what's going to happen. Okay? So we're going to go to Luke, and we're going to go to chapter 4, and we're going to start off in verse 1. 
And, and, and I'm not going to read them all down and then come back. I'm going to read them, and as we go, we're going to discuss each and every verse as we go down. Okay? It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the, by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I want to talk to you for a second about this. Is, is G, then Jesus... He was then, or being filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the most important thing that you and I can have happen inside of our lives. We need to get out of the way and allow the Holy Spirit to dictate to us everything that's going on inside of our lives. Every decision you make, every thought you have. If something comes through your mind, you need to take that thought captive and throw it away and allow the Holy Spirit to fulfill and top you off. In every area. Now, that does what that also means is, is you're not going to have those little areas of yourself that you're going to hold over for yourself. Okay? What you're going to do is, is you're going to completely open yourself up and tell the Holy Spirit, Here I am, fill me up. Help me to get out of the way of me. Because when I get in the way of me, that's when I get stupid and make the wrong decisions. The Holy Spirit will never, ever lead you in an in direct, or a bad way. You're going to have more power than Satan has just because of who lives on the inside of you. And it's getting out of the way and allowing the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you. Give him that area. And don't do the things that you used to do, but allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in the things you need to do. And so you're returning from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Again, Jesus is allowing the Holy Spirit to dictate to him every area of his life. If the Holy Spirit says, go out and walk from here to Buckner, you go out and you walk from here to Buckner. Now, some of us, it may take a little longer, and we might be sweating a little harder when we got there. Okay? But there's a reason why you're doing what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. You're being filled, which gives you the power and the authority to do the things that need to be done. But then, not only that is, is you've turned your life over and you've allowed the Holy Spirit to have victory inside of you, and you're doing what he's telling you to do. Now, it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Now, I look at this wilderness here, and people go, there ain't no wilderness around here. Step outside them doors. Step outside them doors. The world is the wilderness they want you to live a defeated, sad, no caring, uneventful, no power, no nothing life. Now that, when we're led into the wilderness, we got to have victory inside of that wilderness. But when we step outside through those doors, because we are going where the Holy Spirit told us to go, because we have the power that the Holy Spirit gives us, then we will have victory in the wilderness because we're not going to be put into a position or a place that you and I will not have victory inside of our lives. So when you step out inside that world, you're looking for somebody to give you a problem. Let's get them, Holy Spirit. Let's go. We're going to make it happen. I'm not here anymore to live a mediocre life because you living on the inside of me, I am now going to have victory inside of my life. I am going to have what you have promised me to have since the time you came to live on the inside of me. And just like Jesus here, let's face it, he's not dealing with some little demon that we're talking about. He is dealing with Satan, the big daddy of the big daddies of the demon world. But the great part about it is, if Jesus has victory over him, so can you. doesn't make any difference who it is. Some people say, well, Randy, you don't know what I go through. I don't need to know what you go through. The Holy Spirit needs to know what you go through. And when you give it to him and allow him to have that victory inside of his life, he will give you the victory that you need to have. So you don't live in fear because there's nothing to fear. And then in here it says, in verse 2, it says, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Now, Jesus is being tempted by 40 days, and I think he's tempted in every way possible that a man could be tempted. There is nothing you can tell me that you've been tempted by that Jesus was not already tempted by also. 
Now, did it say that he fell? Oh, my gosh, look at, the, look at all the situation going on. You don't know how difficult things are. Yes, I do. Your different difficult is different than my difficult, but our difficult is nothing compared to the difficult of Jesus. So he's having victory inside of the li his life and the things that are going on, but he is being tempted just like you and I in every area. He's not going to leave us out there hanging by ourselves, folks, and he's not going to go tell you to have victory over something that he already did not conquer. And Satan's attacking him and giving it to him, and he's trying to. And in those 40 days, he ate nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but if I go one day or I miss a meal, I get grumpy. Am I the only person in here that could be that way? No. So one day would be a real push for me. Forty days would be a very difficult situation. Okay? Now you're all kind of looking at me like, yeah, 40 days. Yeah, 40 days. Again, more than I think you or I, either one, could have sustained. But Jesus did. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, is he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to have the victory inside of that area, and he's not going to allow Satan to take over what's going on. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. I find it real interesting. It's just like, well, yeah, he kind of didn't have nothing to eat, and he's just kind of hungry. I would be the a.k.a. known as the starving young man sitting over on the pew with no energy to go get nothing because I hadn't eaten in 40 days. Now, is anyone else in here, now be honest about it, have you ever sometimes, it seems like your problems are the biggest difficulties that ever existed in the world? I mean, they could take out a billboard and list each one of your problems up on that billboard. They could call in the National Guard to come help you to get over to the food pantry so you could have a little bit to eat because you don't got no energy. I, I mean, let's face it, folks. We overreact to our difficulties. But Jesus doesn't hear. Why? He stated a fact. He does not deny that there was a situation that was going on, but what he did is, is stated a fact about it, and he's going to go take care of it. Also, if you notice, too, here, that is... Satan knows what your weakest, weakest, weakest is at that point. And today may be different than your weakest tomorrow. Okay? So now you're looking at it, it says, in verse 3, and it says, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, when I read that, if you are, I see the Satan speaking that in the most arrogant, condescending, pointing his finger at him, questioning him in every aspect of everything that's going on of Jesus. That's why he's doing it. Well, if you are, come on. Please. Now, our terminology today is a little different than theirs, but, but if you look at it, people inside of the world say the same thing to us. I had a man one time, I told him that I tie 10% of my check, and I thought he was going to fall out. He couldn't, you give them 10% of your money, and his statement should have been, you're that stupid, was kind of what he said it. And I told him, and I was honest about it, I said, I live better on 90, buddy, than you do on 100. Okay? But Satan and the world is going to think, cause you to, dis, I mean, not to believe the truth of God. He's going to make it sound like you're just being stupid in everything that you try to do. You mean you get up and you go to church on Sunday? That's your one day a week to sleep in? Huh? You can't imagine not going, but people in the outside world, in the wilderness, are going to question you, and they're going to try diligently to make you think you're stupid. To question what you're doing and why you're doing it. But verse 4 says, but Jesus said, but Jesus answered him saying, it is written. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, it is written. That means to me that it's a fact. It's not up for discussion. It's not up for your interpretation. It's not up for what you believe it ought to be. What it is, is it is written. It is written in stone. It is a fact. There's no questioning about it. There's no discussion about it. What it is, is, is it's a fact. So how does Jesus have victory over Satan? By telling him the word of God, repeating it to him, and speaking the word and not saying, well, you know, maybe. I think, I think it's in here somewhere. I think that's what it says. No, he repeats the word of God to him, and he informs Satan, it is written. In other words, this is how it is. This is the facts. This is what's going to happen. And then verse 5 says, Then the devil, devil taking up on the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in that moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I give, I give you and their, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you wish, will wish, will worship before me, all will be yours. I look at this as Satan is saying, if you worship me, I'll make sure you got everything you think you need. But what he doesn't realize is he's already got everything I need. Okay? Sometimes if you've ever been dealing, have you ever gone to a store and they give you the change back and they give you more money than you should have? Okay? I just went to Sam's Club and, and purchased uh, some stuff and the lady checked me out, and I know her, and she was a manager, and she was checking me out, and I was walking out, and I looked at the receipt, and she had not charged me for an item. I hadn't, and I'd actually, believe it or not, I had gotten past the gate where they check you. I was very, very surprised on that one. I know they didn't watch it. I'm there every week, so they kind of know me. But I went back into that woman, and I said, you did not charge me for this. I need to pay you for this. And she kind of looked at me funny. And I told her, I said, if I ever come back in and tell you that I didn't get charged, that I that I got did I paid for something and didn't get it, or that you charged me too much, or anything I tell you on this bill, I expect you to believe me. Because I'm not gonna lie to you. If I will give you money that I don't have to, I will expect you to be honorable and do the same for me. Okay? So what the world has to offer in material possessions is not as important as what my honor is. I'm a representative of God. I'm not going to shortchange somebody and then laugh about it and say, oh, look at what, they're, they're going to be short on their books, and I don't care because I'm going to take their money. I've held my hand. I had a girl give me change one time, and I, di I didn't even walk away from the counter. I just looked at it. And even as slow as I am, I knew it was wrong. And I said, count this. And she looked at me like I was questioning her. I said, hon, you gave me too much. And I gave it back to her. And she's like, oh, thank you. I mean, it's like I bought a $5 item and gave her a 20, and she gave me back my 20 and the change. And she's running the register. <laughs> but... But what I'm saying here is that Satan is going to ask you, what is the price of your honor? What is it? Because if you walk out with it and they catch you, then you've just sold your honor. And, and there's, there, I'm going to say there's going to be mistakes that are going to be made and accidents, and you're going to do things and, and like that. But I've, I have gone back to places and given them back their money. I just don't want to have anybody ever say that I stole from them or that I shortchanged them. I'm a representative of Jesus. I don't need their money. And the best part is, is I don't want their money. I'd rather be an honest witness to them. 
But what Satan's doing here is, is he's trying to tempt Jesus into material possessions that the world thinks are worth something. And I'm telling you what, folks, they're not. What, what people think of value, they drive a fancy car, they have a big house, but they're not happy, they're not content, they just always want more and more and more. So Jesus says in verse 9, then he, excuse me, verse 8, and, then, and Jesus said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, again, he's quoting him back with Scripture, and he's telling him to get behind me, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. What the world has to offer, I don't want. Because if I had it, then I would be under the control of the world. But if I do what God tells me to do, back up at the very beginning of this, if the Holy Spirit instructs me to do something and I do it, then I am under the control of God, not under the control of the world. Verse 9. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Again, Satan is doing the arrogance of questioning him of, are you truly the Son of God? Has anybody ever heard, are you truly a Christian? I thought you were a Christian. How many times have you heard that one? Okay. But what Satan is trying to do here is, is he is trying to get him to overstep what God has instructed him. You don't tempt God. There's no reason to just be extra stupid. If you, I mean, we already are stupid. We just don't need to be extra stupid. Verse 10, Jesus says, For it is written, again, quoting Scripture, He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hand they shall bear you up, lest you dash your, your foot against a stone. So Satan, excuse me, Satan is going back to him. I'm sorry, I turned pages. Satan is going back and saying, this is what the Bible says if, if, if I'm turning it, turning it around so that it's not appropriate to him. I'm sorry, I, I misquoted. I changed pages and lost it. But verse 12 says, And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. I'm not going to put myself in a position so that I am tempting what, say, I mean, what God does. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. He's already written down all the instructions for me. He already knows what I, I already know what he wants me to do. I'm going to follow along. Why would I go out there and stand on the edge of the cliff just to see if I could jump off? It's not the fall that kills you, folks. It's the sudden stop at the bottom. So while you're falling, you think you're testing God. In reality, you're just being stupid. And then when you hit the bottom of whatever you think God's going to get you out of, the injuries are going to be far worse than you think because you have tempted God. In verse 13 it says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now I want you to think about this. Is Now when the devil had ended every temptation, that tells me again, there is nothing that you and I could go through that Jesus hasn't already had victory in. There's nothing you and I could ever have happened to us that the Holy Spirit hasn't already had victory in. There's nothing that we can do that the Holy Spirit doesn't already have the answer for you before you step into the situation. So my question to you is, is why are you living in fear of what the world has to offer you when you've already got victory over the situation? I mean, we're living there. People live in fear, afraid of what's going to happen, instead of taking that chance and stepping out into it. I've been having this in a personal situation of my own. I, I work for the church, and, I, and I, I've got time at the end of the week that I can do some stuff. And I have, uh, God has given me ability to take pictures. And I don't know about you guys, but to me it's one of the easiest things in the world. You hold up the camera and go click. But people don't look at it that way. 
okay? And I truly believe God has instructed me to start a small at-home business doing it that will allow me to be flexible and be able to go about it. But I'm telling you all right now, it's concerning to me. But you know what really it is, is, is I need to put my faith in the Holy Spirit. If he has instructed me to do this, then I am to do it. And if I don't do it, I'm in sin for not doing it. So sometimes it's taking the chance when you know the Holy Spirit has said, hey, get out there. Hey, you need to go do this. But why do we live in fear? Because we're depending upon ourselves instead of the Holy Spirit. And that part was for me, guys, so I'm just throwing it out there. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 27. I'm just going to summarize it. And it says, Jesus teaches in the synagogue at Nazareth. It's his hometown. Jesus reads from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. It talks about how the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, Jesus, and how God had anointed him. Jesus is telling the people in the synagogue that he is God. And that he, as with other prophets, are not respected in their own land. Now we're going to deal a little bit with, with what these people tried to do to Jesus. And it looks like a very bad situation. But Jesus is telling them the truth. And the problem we have here is, is the world does not want to hear the truth. The, ro- the world wants to hear what is convenient and tickles their ears. I'll tell you what, folks, we are very blessed to have a pastor here that tells us how it is. If I, I, I have been going here for numerous years and when I go someplace else I'm sitting in the back if you know you visit somebody and go to grandma's house and you go to their church and you're like give me something <laughs> I don't need your foo-foo I, I, I need I need something feed me and when you get used to it it's very difficult not to have it if I don't get my sto- toes stepped on pretty regular I, I don't think something's going on And it's not that that pastor is pointing out things to me particularly, but what pastor's doing is is he's telling the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's telling pastor what to say. And it may be different for you, and it may be different for you, but when I'm back up there, I hear it too, and it's different for me. Doesn't mean, and sometimes he doesn't only step on toes, he's clear up past the ankle. But what Jesus is doing here is, is he's telling these people, listen, I am the Son of God, and they don't want to hear it. And then we're going to go down to uh, 28 through 30. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Have you ever had somebody, you tell them the truth, and they get mad? They don't want to hear what is truth. They want to hear what tickles them, their ears. They get angry because you're telling them the truth, and they don't want to hear it. Verse 29. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow on the, brow on the hill, thank you, on which the city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Have you ever been in a situation where you think it's all over, folks? They're going to come take away everything I own. Nobody likes me anymore. I mean, let's face it, there, this, is, this is a situation here would be, I would call it dire circumstances. you got a whole congregation of people that are getting ready to throw him off a cliff. I would say he's in, in, in the world's eyes, he's in trouble. Have, has anybody else ever been there? Yes. Sometimes it seems like it's daily. Okay? But I want you to think about What's going to happen here in just a second? It says, Jesus is in a tough spot. It looks like certain death. But how did Jesus have victory over this? I love this verse. Verse 30. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. He didn't hide. He didn't try to fight his way out. He didn't try to discuss his way out of it. 
he passed through, which means everybody was still there. And he went through it. Now, when you look at this, I want you to think about it as if Jesus has the Holy Spirit in him and he can walk through what looks like certain death, what about us? What the world perceives the situation to be is not what it is. The Holy Spirit is going to direct you to do what you should be doing in that situation. And when you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, you will have victory no matter what the world thinks it, that you're going to have happen. So Jesus went right through the midst of them. And sometimes the best thing to do is just turn it over to God and go to sleep. That's the only thing you can do. Because you're not going to have victory on your own. The Holy Spirit's going to give you the victory in that situation. So what do you do? You walk right through the midst, and you continue doing exactly what the Holy Spirit tells you to do in that situation. You don't change. You don't alter. You don't call, and as pastor says, you don't call Facebook. <laughs> you don't call your friends. You don't ask opinions. The one you speak to is the Holy Spirit. And when he, you, when he tells you to do something, you do it. And then what did Jesus do? He went his way. And what I find interesting is, is when he went his way, it doesn't say anything about the people who were getting ready to harm him following him. They didn't pursue him. It doesn't say he ran and hid. It says he went his way. He had victory over the situation because he did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. And folks, we can do the same thing, the exact same thing. Whenever the world looks at us and tries to give us his answer, I mean, um, tries to give us what the answer is to be to the situation, we shouldn't listen to the world. We need to go into the scriptures and see what the Holy Spirit tells us to do about it. What is written in the, in the Bible is the answer to your problems, not what the world says about it. Now I'm going to read just a few verses here, or a couple of them. It says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as a common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So no matter what kind of ignorance you get yourself into, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the way to get out. I did not say that it was going to be an easy way or that you weren't going to have no bumps, no bruises. But what I was going to say is, is you're going to have a way to get out of it. You will have victory over the situation because of the Holy Spirit. But how smart would it be if you had listened to the Holy Spirit in the beginning? You wouldn't have put yourself in the position to start with. Now, we all do it, folks. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you about that. But what I am going to tell you is, that when you have victory over the situation, the next time something comes up, you say, oh, no, I don't want to get in that again. Mm -mm, I'm done. Thank you very much. No. I'm going to go over here. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So if we're following Jesus' example, we can get through the situation just like he did and be able to have victory inside of it and not have the sin inside of our lives. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus was tempted in every way that we that you and I could ever be tempted. Jesus had victory over sin, Satan, and this world. Jesus wants to be the high priest. He wants to be the intermediate between you and God so that you can have victory in your life. But you must accept Jesus as your Savior and become a Christian to have Jesus become your high priest. 
Once you accept Jesus as your Savior, you will have the same Jesus that's living in you that has already had victory over Satan. Jesus gives you the ability to have victory in the battle against Satan and this world. That is the only way that we will be able to have victory over Satan is to follow the examples of Jesus Christ and to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. And when you do that, folks, don't think you're going to have it. Expect to have victory. Thank you. That's the sermon for this evening. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, if there is an offering plate up here, um, we're not going to have a closing song, but I will be up front for a little bit. If you have something you would like to discuss with me, I would be more than happy to come, ha come up and have you pray. I'll pray with you or whatever else is going on inside of your life. Uh, I don't have the answers, folks, but I know the one that does. So I thank you so much for coming this evening. Have a safe week. Uh, let me just give you a closing prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for the service this evening, Lord. And I thank you for being the one that's going to give us the answer to all the problems and difficulties inside of our life. We just love you so much, and we thank you for all that you do for us. Be with everyone here, and we thank you again for just directing us in the ways that we go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What? Pray for <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, okay.